side for Vieira, who will play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal, Gabriel Jesus to finish it off, oh what a way to do it, Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal, he's back and he's back with a bang, into the penalty area it goes, Gabriel Keller and it's into the back of the net, Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Happy Sunday. Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simeon. And on today's episode, we're going to talk Gabriel Martinelli, who seems to have found form at the right time as far as his international side are concerned. We're going to talk about Aaron Ramsdale and what the future looks like for the England goalkeeper. Some talk of Aaron Ramsdale potentially going out on loan. We're also going to talk Douglas Louise after it was reported that Villa could be tempted to sell him this summer due to some of their PSR concerns. And we'll discuss whether or not we can expect some business before the European Championships kick off in less than a week's time. Lots and lots to get stuck into on this episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Don't go anywhere. Leave a like on the video if you're watching us, of course, on YouTube. If you're listening on audio, you know the drill. Leave us a review. It really, really does help. Let's dive in to our first story. Gabriel Martinelli scored Brazil's second goal in their 3-2 victory over Mexico last night. Nice to see him showing some form ahead of this summer's Copa America. I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, where was that form in the second half of the season? When, to be honest, you know, you have to say Gabriel Martinelli's form did desert him a little bit. Look, this is why you need a squad. This is why you need alternative options, because when Gabriel Martinelli wasn't producing in terms of outputs, we were able to bring somebody in of the level of Leandro Trossard, who came in and was massively key, actually, in continuing our title charge and taking it right down to the final day. He consistently impacted games. He consistently stepped up in big moments when we needed him to. I know people will point to that miss against Aston Villa, but outside of that, his finishing has been exemplary um, and his contribution has been huge. But to take it back to Martinelli, who we're speaking about, I actually felt sorry for him a lot last season. He had some injury problems that, of course, I think saw him drop out of the side initially and then he struggled really to find the same form. And I almost feel sometimes with Gabriel Martinelli, he can try too hard, if that makes sense. He is, by his nature, a very direct player, someone who gets his head down, someone who likes to take people on, someone who quite often will receive the ball and think, right, I need to get to the byline here as quick as possible. And that's obviously something that Mikel Arteta values and the Arsenal value, because it's why he's held down a position in this team for so long. And even when he was going through that rocky patch of form, there was still a lot of the time a temptation from Mikel Arteta to select him because he's so different to everything else that we have. Yes, he's a right-footed player playing on the left. And at some point, he's probably going to want to cut in. But he's so quick and he's such a driven runner that often Gabriel Martinelli can fool you because you think he's going to come inside and he probably will eventually. But he does it a lot later than a lot of other players. And he is willing to take you on on the outside. He does stretch teams. His work rate defensively is incredible as well. I noticed it more so this season, I'd say, than I did last season, um, where the left hand side was a little bit mix and match. It wasn't quite as functional as it was the season prior certainly wasn't as functional as our right-hand side. But a lot of the time we were able to keep those clean sheets and defend well down that side, generally speaking, because not only were people, different people coming in at left back and bringing different skill sets, but because we had Gabriel Martinelli for a lot of the campaign working back and working really hard. I'd love him to have a good Copa America because if he does, that would be a huge confidence boost for him going into the new season. And listen, I'm not one of these people that subscribes to the idea of he's done at Arsenal and you need to move him on. I think he's had a blip. I think he's had a disappointing season by the very high standards that he set the season prior. And we need to give him the benefit of the doubt. And he has a massive role and part to play in this group going forward. 
super likable, um, super dangerous when he's on his game. And I think it's a bit like with Bukayo Saka. Like I remember midway, maybe through the 23-24 season, we were saying, you know, Saka's not quite as effective as he was in the season before. And, you know, what's changed, what's happened is his form. And I remember us having those discussions and saying, look, at this point last season, him and Martinelli and Odegaard had all contributed loads of goals. And we kind of got to the halfway point of last season and none of them were anywhere near those numbers. And I think that's why people probably looked at Arsenal and thought they need a striker first and foremost. And secondly, can they actually sustain this title challenge? And we managed to click in the second half, not because um, there was uh, a load of genius sort of from Mikel Arteta. I think that he did some really smart things in different areas of the pitch. So I think the way he sort of adjusted the midfield worked really well for us. Um, he changed the approach at left back. He was inverting the right back at points. He did lots of things around the team to get us working in a far more cohesive and, and fluid way. But I think when it comes to the wingers, it was just about them figuring out what needs to be done ever so slightly differently to give them those advantages, to give them those opportunities to receive the ball in the spaces that they like to, and to get the ball to their feet without them having automatically three or four players around them. And that required those adjustments, as I say, that Mikel made through the team, but also those guys to figure those out. And I think in the second half of last season, Bakayo Saka figured it out. I'm not sure that Gabriel Martinelli ever did. And I think that's something that he needs to work on over the summer. But you could see towards the end of the campaign that when he was getting minutes, he was trying too hard. He was desperate to make an impact. And as a result of that, he was fluffing chances and, you know, making mistakes that he wouldn't normally make Gabriel Martinelli. So I think if he can have a really strong and positive Copa America, that will do us the world of good and him the world of good in terms of his confidence. And then you can focus on the summer on improving those bits of his game to make him the threat that he was the season before. OK, let's talk uh, Aaron Ramsdale, because there have been some reports over the last sort of 24, 48 hours that actually where we were all talking about Aaron Ramsdale being sold this summer, there's a chance that he isn't sold and actually that he leaves on loan. Now, I think this is a decision that will probably be taken later on in the window. The window's not technically opened yet, but later on in the summer, you know what I'm trying to say. I think Arsenal have an asking price for Aaron Ramsdale of probably around about £30 million, which I've said to you guys on recent episodes, I think is going to be difficult to achieve. I think when you look at the market, you look at the PSR stuff and the grip that that's taken on clubs, and you look at the fact that Aaron Ramsdale's played, what, I think he played six times um, last season off the top of my head. It might be slightly more, it might be slightly less. He played a handful of times, basically. Who is going to go and spend that kind of money on a goalkeeper that hasn't played, that's out of rhythm, that's probably um, not anywhere near where he needs to be in terms of match sharpness and readiness? And I know you could say that for everyone in the summer, but you get the point I'm trying to make. He's not played consistent regular football for a season now. And go back to the PSR stuff that I just mentioned. It's going to be very, very difficult, I think, for clubs to go out and spend mega amounts of money this summer. And so the 30 million price tag that maybe we thought was realistic, we might find over the course of the window that it isn't. And so there is the possibility that Aaron Ramsdale is allowed to go out on loan. And according to reports, this is something that Arsenal are considering. Now, the benefit of that would be that Aaron Ramsdale would be playing regular football somewhere. You'd assume that on that basis, his form would improve. And if his form improves and he's in the spotlight again, then all of a sudden he becomes a much more valuable asset again. And you're more likely to achieve that £30 million fee that we've been talking about for a little while now. The negative to that is that you're not getting the money in now in order to aid you and help you when um, you know, you're, you're trying to bring players in. We know that the PSR rules are going to be relaxed further down the line as well. So is there a greater need to get money in today than there would be 12 months down the line? And actually, if you were to get 20 million now or 10 million in a year's time, given the way that the PSR rules are going to change and that that's going to be relaxed going forward, 
is it more valuable at this time to get 20 million in the door in this accounting period than it is to get 30 million in the door 12 months down the line? I don't know. That's a business decision that the club will need to make. His current contract runs until 2026, but there is an option to extend that by a further year. So essentially, Arsenal, when going into the market and potentially selling Aaron Ramsdale, will have that up their sleeve and be able to say, well, no, actually he's contracted until 2027, which obviously helps us. But yeah, I, I think it's so dependent on whether we need that wiggle room within our transfer budget this summer and within our PSR situation. Um, I think that's that's what this is going to probably come down to. I think there will be interest in Aaron Ramsdale, but I think the price is going to have to be dropped because I think there are a lot of clubs that will look at him and think he's a really good goalkeeper. He's a really good character, really good person to have around. But I, I, I really do believe that the market is going to look very, very different this summer in comparison to previous summers where, you know, the spending was a lot more frivolous and clubs were a lot bolder in their decisions and were more than happy to take greater risks. I just think when you look at what's happened over the course of the 23-24 campaign, some of the implications for clubs that didn't adhere to the PSR stuff, you know, nobody really wants to take that risk. And I think the whole market is going to be impacted. So when it comes to Premier League players, I think you can drop the market or, or drop the price, I should say, across the board. This isn't something that's exclusive to Arsenal. I think the prices are going to drop across the board. But then if you factor in that Ramsdale hasn't played and the situation he's been in, then you can understand why clubs will probably want to wait a little bit longer um, and see what kind of deal they can make. Now, will Aaron Ramsdale be happy with that? I don't know. Um, will Aaron Ramsdale feel that his time at Arsenal has come to an end and that he needs a permanent move, perhaps? Um, and in that case, maybe we'd look at it differently as a football club. But I hadn't really considered the idea of sending him out on loan. Uh, but according to these reports uh, that have been doing the rounds, Arsenal are considering that idea, which I think is an interesting idea that has its pros and cons. Um, but I know that that will be met with frustration by a lot of the supporters, I think, particularly if we then don't go out and get what they think we need to get in the summer. They'll say, well, why did we loan him out? Why didn't we cash in? Why didn't we get that bit of money in the door. But that's the latest on Aaron Ramsdale's future. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'd love to keep him. Um, I think he's a great person. Um, I think he's as good a second choice goalkeeper as you're going to find. And yeah, if he's content with staying another season and competing with David Ryan, remember they're going to be more games next season, then I'm fine with him staying. I just find it very difficult to believe that Aaron Ramsdale, who was clearly very upset about the fact that he wasn't playing much last season, is going to accept this role that he has at Arsenal and be willing to continue in that way. So for me, it's all on him. The ball is very much in Aaron Ramsdale's court. OK, let's talk Douglas Louise, the Aston Villa midfielder that Arsenal were linked with in the past. If you go back a couple of years in the uh, summer window, we were very interested in Douglas Louise. In fact, we made a couple of offers to Aston Villa to try and sign Douglas Louise, and we weren't able to get a deal done at that point. However, according to reports, despite Villa's qualification for the Champions League, they are considering selling Douglas Louise to ease their PSR concerns. They're also said to be interested in Conor Gallagher, which maybe backs this up. I would argue that Unai Emery needs more depth, given that Villa are in the Champions League in the new format, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it does feel like, based on what I'm reading, that Villa are not desperate to move on Douglas Luiz, but if the right money was on the table, I think they'd consider it. And I think that's a lot to do with the contract situation. Now, his contract runs until 2026. So by the time we start the new season, he'll have less than two years on his deal. You know what happens when players get into that final year, their value drops quite significantly. And because of the PSR stuff that we keep talking about today, but it is really super relevant in the situation, I think Villa um, would be open to selling and, and so do some of the top journalists out there. Is he the man for us, I guess, is the question. For me, I had my doubts two years ago and I have my doubts now. I think Douglas Luiz is a good midfield player, but is he transformational? 
Is he somebody that is going to take your team to a whole new level? I also think if I'm Douglas Louise and I'm at Aston Villa, who are obviously on the up, massive football club, historical football club, back in the Champions League for the first time in ages. Like, where else can he go? Like, this is the thing. I, I don't think he starts for us, given the options that we have at the club today. I don't think he starts for Manchester City. He probably starts for United and he probably starts for Chelsea. But look at the positions those football clubs are in. Are they any better off right now today than Aston Villa? No, they're not. So I don't think there'll be a huge willingness on Douglas Luiz's side to go unless it is a club like Arsenal that comes in for him. But I just feel like this is one where the ship has very much sailed. I think he's a fantastic talent. I think he's a really good Premier League midfield player. But if we were signing Douglas Louise, it would be as a squad player to me. Because Douglas Louise is not any better than Declan Rice. And he's not any better than a fit Thomas Partey, who at the time of recording this is still an Arsenal player. Let's not forget that. Now, if Thomas Partey moves on and we need to bolster our midfield options even more than I think we already do, then I think there's a world where Douglas Louise could come in and be in and out of the side and actually work really, really well for us. A midfield of Douglas Louise, Declan Rice and Martin Odegaard. It's not too shabby, is it? It sounds pretty good. Um, but I just, yeah, I find it difficult to believe that Arsenal would go and pay the money that Villa want. I think Villa will probably want in excess of 50 to 60 million pounds. I think that Douglas Louise is someone who, um, you know, has been really solid for a number of seasons now. But th does he really move the needle for Arsenal? That's that's the point I'm trying to make here. That's the point that I keep coming back to as I think out loud here. Does he move the needle? Does he take us from title challengers to title winners? I don't think he does. I think the depth that he could bring if he was brought in as an option could be the difference because we've seen that when we lose players and, you know, that was highlighted when Thomas Partey returned, that if we don't have quite have that right balance in midfield, we're not as good a side. And that's obvious, isn't it? But is he a needle mover? I don't know. I think he'd be a great addition to the squad, but the price would have to be right. And I think Arsenal would still have to go out and do further business in that midfield. And on that basis, you know, I don't think Arsenal are going to do this. David Ornstein reported not that long ago, I think it was around Christmas time, that not everybody at Arsenal is convinced that Douglas Luiz is what they need. Not everybody's convinced that he's the right fit. Now, we've talked a lot about Declan Rice in recent days, and we've talked about how Declan Rice's position going forward could have an influence on, um, you know, what we go and do in the market. Is Declan Rice a six or is he an eight? And if he's an eight, we probably need a six. If he's a six, we need to go out and get an eight. That was kind of the the sort of line that we were going down. And I know that Gunner Blog had reported that, that that was something that Arsenal were looking at as well. I just, yeah, I, I just think for, for us to sign Douglas Louise, we have to pay in excess of 50 to 60 million pounds, in my opinion. And he's either needle mover. I don't think he is. And if I go back to those reports from David Ornstein just a few months ago, it seems like people at Arsenal are not convinced that he's the needle mover and the one either. So I'd say that at this moment in time, it's quite unlikely. Villa probably would sell him if the right offer was there, but I don't think we should be the ones stepping forward and slapping that money on the table. I think it's a situation we should keep a close eye on. You know, watch how it develops. If we get the feeling or the idea that later on in the summer, Villa are, are looking to sell him for, for less than that, then maybe it's something that we go and do. But right now, he wouldn't be at the top of my priority list. So despite Villa's reported desire to move Douglas Louise on for the right price, I don't think Arsenal should be forcing the issue here. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments section below. And finally, on today's show, can we expect Arsenal to do some business ahead of the Euros? Now, the player I'm kind of mainly referring to here is Benjamin Sesko, a player that we've been really heavily linked with over the last few weeks. It's my understanding that nothing's really moved on on that, that the, the conversations have happened behind the scenes, that Benjamin Sesko's representatives are well aware of Arsenal's interest, but nothing has, has progressed on that front. We're constantly hearing that Chelsea are interested, that Chelsea are desperately trying to make something happen behind the scenes. And we also know that RB Leipzig, his current club, 
are interested in keeping him there and have made him a very, very lucrative new offer, uh, contract offer that is, to try and keep the Slovenian at, uh, at the, uh, the German Bundesliga side. Now, we know that the Euros kick off in less than a week's time. On Friday, um, Scotland take on Germany in the opening game of the tournament. And we know that Benjamin Sesko has a release clause to the value of around about £55 million sterling that is only valid until the end of June. I don't mean this horribly, but I don't think Slovenia are going to go very far in the tournament, which means that Benjamin Sesko could be available to solve his future um, prior to that clause expiring. Um, Arsenal could go and trigger that clause if they wanted to, um, even without having the full buy-in of Benjamin Sesko just yet, and then work on his terms if they want to make sure that that deal um, it is still one that they could possibly take. But do I expect, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm answering this question is because I've seen a few people on Twitter say, this is Sesko week, this week coming up, this week that begins tomorrow. This is Benjamin Sesko week. I'm not convinced that it is. I think Arsenal are very relaxed, are very chilled, will know exactly who their targets are and will have done their due diligence in advance. I think whoever is going to come in, in a lot of cases, or in most cases, certainly, because I think we'll bring in more than one player, they've probably got the green light, the club from those pl those players and their representatives, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just about doing the actual transaction. So I think with Benjamin Sesko, can we expect a deal before the Euros? No, I think we're cutting it too fine. Given where I understand we're at and where we need to be at for that deal to be completed within the space of a week, I just don't see it. We're not at the back end of the window where people are desperately trying to hit the deadline. So in answer to the, Slightly more specific question, is this Benjamin Sesko week? I'm going to say no, it's not. And I'm also going to say that I don't expect Arsenal to do any deals, not incomings, not outgoings, before the European Championships begin. Now, remember, we can sign players that aren't at the European Championships and we can sell players that aren't at the European Championships. So there's a chance that we do business during the tournament. However, I believe our major business will come after the tournament. And in terms of sales, I think, as I've always said, we're probably going to have to wait until a later point in the window to see some real movement on that. Because as I keep on telling you, clubs will want to bide their time and try and get the best deals possible. So, yeah, don't get your hopes up. Don't get too excited. Don't spend all of next. And I could be wrong here, but don't spend all of next week waiting to, to hear some kind of announcement because I don't think we're going to get one that quickly. I'd like to see us move forward. I'd like to see us progress with our targets. But from what I hear about where we're at with Benjamin Sesko, and I know that Tom Canton said this this morning, and I know that others have reported it too, it doesn't feel like we're anywhere near as far down the progression line on this than maybe some have suggested previously. Let me know your thoughts and your comments. Get me some questions as well in the uh, comments section below on this video, and I will uh, respond to some of those on the next episode. If you're listening on Apple, we need to get to 500 reviews ASAP. Please do uh, leave me a review. If you're listening on Spotify, we're on course for a thousand reviews. Please do that. It really, really does help me. Subscribe to the channel if your brand spanking you, and I'll see you all on the next one. Enjoy your Sunday up the Arsenal. Goodbye.